Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And a very warm welcome to everybody that's in attendance uh, from a very cold, wet and grey Cape Town. Um, it's wonderful to have you all attending. Uh, my name is Julian Conrad. I am a secretary of the IAH South Africa. And also on behalf of the Groundwater Division Western Cape Branch, I welcome you all to the Western Cape Hydrogeology Postgraduates Show and Tell Seminar. And uh, also welcome to our VIPs, and it's fantastic to have Dr. Gideon Trudeau with us. So a special welcome to you as well, Gideon, thank you. An event like this is long overdue. Um, I really wanted to have an in-person meeting, but with uh, wave three upon us, it's not possible. So we've had to meet online, but that has advantages as well. It means we can reach out to a wider community. Unfortunately, we can't share a beer after the event, but maybe next time. And I feel it's really important to share information about research, and that's how this idea really came about. I think it's important for the researchers to know what's happening in the research sector, but as well as um, industry to know, municipalities to know what research is going on, um, the private sector as well as the government sector. So I think it's good to know what kind of research is happening. And that also in the future, it'd be good if industry can even guide certain research projects and, and push research projects in certain directions, because we certainly need help as well. So yeah, and uh, this afternoon, it's really a very high speed, very rapid overview of the research that is happening in the Western Cape. And the format is really a seven minute presentation uh, from the speakers. So that's about seven slides. And then we've got three minutes for Q&A uh, and then the transition to the next speaker. So the, with regard to the Q&A, um, it'll be great if you post it in the chat um, your questions, and then I will, at the end of that presenter's um, presentation, I will summarize the questions. I'll have a look at them and then pose one or two questions to the presenter, and then we'll move on to the next speaker. So please post your questions uh, into the chat. And also, I just want to mention this is by no means all the presenters uh, in the, uh, sorry, not all the researchers in the Western Cape, uh, there are more. Um, but because this is such a rapid overview, if there are any topics that really interest you, um, please contact me. We can certainly arrange another seminar where we can be focused on a certain topic uh, that's being researched. So please let me know afterwards if you would like more detail uh, around any of the presentations or any of the topics, and that can, can easily be arranged, not a problem at all. Okay, so um, I, which I, without much further ado, I'd like to commence with the program. And as you know, um, our groundwater community is pretty small, so it's always a great pleasure and it's, a, it's, it's exciting to have uh, new hydrogeologists in the area. Uh, and uh, with that, it's a very, very special welcome to Dr. Reynold Chow, who has now joined the University of Stellenbosch as a hydrogeologist. So Reynold, to you, um, a very, very warm welcome. It's lovely that your family have been able to join you only at the end of last week. Um, but that's great as well. So a big welcome to you, Reynold. And it would be great if you kind of ran through your CV, give us a little bit of background on what you've done, who you are, and what you're planning to do. Thanks very much, Reynold. Thanks so much for the warm introduction. Um, let me just see if I'm sharing the correct screen. I think it's the actual presentation mode, eh? Not just the... Um, not the... Uh, presenter mode, but yeah, hopefully that's the correct one. Um, so just to run out a little bit about myself, I'm from Toronto, Canada, and um, oh, maybe I should share on this screen so that I'm actually staring into the camera. Let me just quickly swap this. Sorry about this. And just going to see if I can share the correct screen here. All right, I think that's, that's probably the best that I'm going to be able to do here. So just a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in, in Canada. I went to the University of Waterloo for my bachelor's and master's, fo focusing on hydrogeology. Then I worked briefly at a geotechnical engineering company where I developed groundwater models for mostly for the mining industry. 
Then I completed a PhD in, at the universities of Tübingen and Stuttgart in Germany and completed a postdoc at, um, oops, sorry, at the uh, ETH Zurich um, and AAVEG. So the courses that I'm currently running at the University of Stellenbosch is the Introduction to Hydrogeology, the Advanced Hydrogeology course, and also Isotope Hydrology. And we have hopes to develop a hydrogeologic field course, hopefully at the Stellenbosch um, farms, um, where we can conduct pumping tests and various other sorts of uh, hydrogeologic uh, field techniques. And then also hopefully a groundwater modeling course um, on mod flow, specifically groundwater vistas. Currently, I am supervising a master's student and two honor students, so Rashitsa, who will give a more in-depth presentation uh, later on at this meeting. Bryn and Emma, who are, Bryn is looking at developing a conceptual hydrogeologic model of the Cape Flats area, and Emma is looking at uh, evaluating pesticide use data in the Western Cape. Um, so, a little bit about some of the other um, research areas I'm looking into is uh, applying numerical groundwater models to various other uh, aspects of uh, resource extraction, hopefully in South Africa. This is just an example of a mod flow model I developed in Canada, where you can see there's just several open pits here that um, are trying to be simulated in, in mod flow. And something else that I've been working on recently is trying to develop a groundwater model to simulate a process uh, groundwater surface water inter interactions and um, specifically a process called hyperaric exchange where surface water is kind of flowing and then entering the subsurface and then going back into uh, the river again. And specifically uh, the new aspects we're looking at is trying to do this in what we call a fractured uh, bedrock river. So here you can see the differences between like a, a regular fluvial river and a fractured bedrock river. And this is the conceptual model that we've developed for a specific um, study area in Canada. This is close to a, a town called Guelph. And this is just a, a quick snapshot of a, of, a, of a video file that we've created that shows the simulation. Here you can see on the bottom, uh, just like the time stamps as it's going forward in time. We can see actually, this is a, it's as if we were to inject a tracer into the subsurface and we can see it downwelling and then upwelling through the river, through the, through the individual fractures uh, in the subsurface. And another ongoing project is looking at aquatic pesticide pollution in the Western Cape. Uh, these are, this is an, an example here of the passive samplers that have been uh, placed in the rivers where it's picking up uh, pesticide pollution from the, from the water. And these are the three main catchment areas that uh, we've looked into. One is the Peketberg, the other is the Hex uh, River catchment, and then Grabau. And these are just some preliminary results that have come out recently where we've been seeing that imidacloprid, which is a specific insecticide, is, is um, particularly problematic um, in the Hex River catchment. Here you can just see an image of the concentrations the 14 day average concentrations within three different catchments. And this red line here depicts the environmental quality standards. So anything above that line, and it can be detrimental to aquatic organisms. Um, and here we can see that this is a log scale, which means that you know, every, every increment is actually um, 10 times um, higher concentrations. And we can see that we're well above this red line in the hex catchment for this particular insecticide. So yeah, these are some of the current research areas. And of course, there's always masters and PhD opportunities that are available. So please feel free to contact me after the presentation if any of these topics are of interest to you. Thanks. Ronald, thank you very, very much. And once again, a very warm welcome to you and your family, both to Stellenbosch University and to the town of Stellenbosch as well. Thank you, Ronald. Thanks. I'd like to move on to the next person. Uh, it's Dr. Jared from Roy. And, um, and Jared is really a superstar in terms of he has got very involved with IH at the international level. Um, he's rolled up his sleeves and dived in there, which is really fantastic. He has built an incredible uh, laboratory at the Stellenbosch University, and he's completing some amazing research. And um, so, Jared, please tell us a little bit more about what 
you are up to. Thanks. Hi, Julian. Thank you very much. Sorry, also just bringing this off. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm always relish have an opportunity to connect with the other groundwater specialists, hydrogeologists and isotope hydrologists and the like, especially in South Africa. So today I just kind of wanted to give an overview of uh, our current facilities and research projects at Stellenbosch. Um, I, on most of the slides, I'll have my email and our lab head's email, Janine, uh, Dr. Janine Colling. Uh, so if you have any further questions or would like to reach out to us, please uh, pop us an email. Uh, so at this point, um, we have some facilities online, uh, these being cation and anion analysis on our iron chromatograph, uh, chromatography uh, unit. And uh, we have in-house prices and then also external and industry prices as well. And uh, you can go on to the Stellenbosch uh, Central Analytical Facility website if you want to get more information about that. And then uh, I have set up and run uh, our LGR triple liquid water isotope analyzer. And uh, here we can analyze uh, 18O and deuterium as well as 17O stable isotopes in water. And uh, we'll look a bit more at some of the projects we're working on using this uh, machine later. And then we can do a uh, lab precision pH and EC measurements at the moment with our titrator, and then as well as a whole lot of coliform uh, measurements as well, uh, which is part of the, the more bio bio biochemistry side of what our unit does. And then uh, in the near future, we're going to have some new uh, machinery come online, uh, which is going to open up our capacity to facilitate more uh, soil and water investigations, especially in the Western Cape, uh, but also in South Africa as well. And this being our um, TOC, our total organic carbon analyzer, uh, which is going to come online soon. We just did the training last week. Uh, but on this machine, we can also do inorganic carbon, uh, dissolved organic carbons, biological nitrogens, and then a total carbon uh, assessment as well. And then uh, we can also do alkalinity, color, and total hardness of water samples, uh, which should come online with our test station in August. And then what's very exciting, especially for me, is that we're getting an IRMS system and an isotope ratio mass spec, and there we'll be able to measure carbon stable isotopes as well as nitrogen as well. And uh, should there be scope for it, uh, we can also set this up for sulfur isotopes. Uh, so if anyone's interested in uh, looking into sulfur isotopes in uh, both liquid and solid samples, uh, we, can, we can set that up as well. And then our discrete analyzer um, is also coming online and there we can you know, isolate specific cations and anions. And then I just wanted to mention here as well that our ICPMS at the uh, Central Analytical Facility Units in Earth Science can do trace metals uh, analysis too. And then uh, we might have some capacity to open up to look at different uh, types of um, disease causing uh, bacterials uh, in water as well. So if there's a scope for that, please get hold of us and we can develop a method to try and facilitate uh, any new studies on that. And then the current research projects that uh, I myself am working on uh, with some collaboration with some colleagues. Uh, at the moment, we're mainly focusing on uh, an urban isotope hydrology project in which we're looking at uh, our domestic water supply and the stable isotope compositions of the source and then both the wastewater and the return flows to local groundwater. And I'll touch on this later at the end of this presentation. And then coming online later this year is a wetland isotope hydrogeochemistry project, uh, also funded by the IAEA. And uh, there's an emergency project that's coming online later this year, uh, but in the next five years, we're gonna expand uh, to more wetlands in the Western Cape and hopefully in other places in South Africa. So. If you're interested in isotope research into wetland health sustainability and its connectivity to groundwater, please also get hold of us. There will be a PhD and, and master's projects associated with this project. And then I've been working quite closely with Dr. Andrew Watson uh, at the Stellenbosch Water Institute, doing both some Berg River catchment hydrological resilience projects, and then as well as some isotope applications uh, in catchment hydrology. And then a bit out of my field, but has been a very interesting uh, project this year. Uh, we've been working with Bjorn van der Hayden in the Earth Science Department 
looking at manganese deposit processes uh, in hot springs in the Table Mountain group, uh, you know, just dating some of these waters using radioactive traces and seeing what uh, processes are causing this mineralization. And then some regional stuff, we're trying to uh, make some ice escapes for South Africa. And we've got collaborators at most of our university affiliates that work with stable isotopes. And then also looking into water mass origin and the regional climates. And then just lastly, from my side for the central analytical facility, we've developed some training videos uh, on our machines that will be up next month. Uh, so please look into that on the central analytical facility website. Uh, if you'd like to participate and learn more about the analysis that we do. And then finally, just to finish things off, uh, just to talk about this urban isotope hydrology project. So we're specifically looking at Stellenbosch, Branchuk and Pal, uh, and the sources of water that come into our domestic supply and uh, how they relate to local rainfall, rivers and groundwater. So, uh, I mean, we're all familiar with the drought. We can see uh, in the top left side, that our dam storage went down. And now uh, in, 20, in 2021, we've recovered very significantly. Uh, but is this because of more rain or is this because we're using less water? And I think um, it's a combination of both, but that's not the whole picture, right? And as we can see here in our drought water restrictions, our consumption went down significantly and uh, hasn't returned to what it was before 2015. And I think this might be because we're getting better at managing our own private water use but also there's other alternate water supplies that are contributing to the system, that being uh, private rainfall collection and wells. Um, in 2016, we had probably about 1,600 registered boreholes, and I'm sure Julian will correct me on this, but I think by now we're upwards of, uh, you know, 26, 28,000 registered boreholes in the city. And we'd like to understand how's that, how that's contributing to our water consumption. So just in our towns, we've set up some uh, groundwater, tap water, rainfall and river water collection sites. And you can see their distribution there. And uh, up, to, up to date, we've been sampling for about 12 weeks. Uh, we can see some interesting distributions. And uh, in the tap water for Paul and Stellenbosch, which is the red and yellow, they have very similar signatures, likely have very similar water sources, which we'd expect, uh, mainly being the Berg River and the Vemershoek dams. And then in Franschuk, we can see some, uh, you know, drift from this. And I think this is because there's some local reservoirs in the town uh, in which they're using to distribute water to the, the users and maybe even some groundwater that's uh, been entered into the system. And then particularly, we can see that the Franschuk groundwater is also a bit distinct and shows a similar profile to these strange tap water readings. And then uh, local rainfall and river water seems more akin to that that what we're receiving in uh, front and Paul. So that's kind of just a snapshot of what we're trying to achieve. And then um, I'm going to leave that slide out for now. And then this is just a long term study we did in Paul. And you can see at the different sites when the municipality changes the water source for different areas. And that's when the orange and blue line leaves the gray line. And that's the switch, right? That's where we get in the different source coming through. And that's just like a basic concept uh, as a premise for this project. So what's next? Yeah, well, we're gonna continue collecting and analyzing samples at least until October this year. And uh, we, yeah, we've already applied for funding to continue this over a long term to help us characterize uh, once groundwater starts being augmented to domestic supply. And then, you know, put these samples in a, in a spatial context and see if we can predict what's going on in other areas. And uh, we always wanna encourage stakeholders to use ISO methods. And that's why I think this is a great initiative today. And more data is always better. Uh, well, mostly, if you can trust it, right? And then we'd like to apply urban isotope methods to more towns and compare results. So if you're interested in expanding something like this where you're from, uh, please get in touch with me. And we do have the capacity to do it. And then naturally, we want to try involve some of our other capacity uh, as our machinery comes online. And I think uh, that's me for today. I've probably reached my seven minutes a while ago. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Jared, thank you so much. Um, that was really great. If you don't mind just putting your camera on, um, I would like to ask a question um, and just a comment. The first comment is, I'd love to know more about isoscapes. So sometime if we could have that discussion, sounds very interesting. But the question is, are your laboratory methods SANS accredited? Uh, so it, 
at this point in time, no, our laboratory methods haven't been accredited by SANS yet, because uh, we need to have, I think it's at least six months of our um, QAQC to present to SANS to get the accreditation, but we are in the process of getting our accreditation, so that is something to be expected, hopefully uh, in the coming months, but likely a year or so before we have full accreditation on all of our methods. Great. Jared, thank you very, very much. Much appreciated and all the best with your work. Thank you very much. Good. Good. I'd like to move on to the first MSc student uh, from the University of the Western Cape. Mikhail, over to you. Unmute, Mikhail. Hi guys, sorry about that. Thanks, Julian. Hi guys, I'm currently a master's student at UWC. Let me just share my screen with you guys. So I'm looking at the fate and occurrence of pharmaceuticals in Cape Town's water network. So pharmaceuticals are part of a group of contaminants of emerging, emerging concerns. And emerging concerns are micro pollutants that are present in the environment and are not regulated and can pose a risk to the health of both humans and wildlife. These include herbicides, flame retardants, microplastics, and pharmaceuticals. So why is this a problem? So there is evidence of low concentrations of pharmaceuticals affecting aquatic organisms and antibiotic resistance occurring in the aquatic environment based on previous studies. The quality of the water resource is also at the risk of being contaminated beyond the recommended concentration limits. And currently there is no regulation in South Africa with regards to the concentration limits for pharmaceuticals. The aim of my research is to investigate the spatial and temporal distribution of pharmaceuticals in the environment with regards to the change in concentration along the flow path from potential sources to sink and also to determine the efficiency of wastewater treatment plants with regards to the removal of pharmaceuticals from wastewater in Cape Town. With the following objectives, to identify and sample at various wastewater treatment plants, groundwater wells and surface water bodies, and also to assess the occurrence and spatial variation of pharmaceuticals as it moves to various mediums in the environment. So this is the, the literature view and some things I'll use to support my thesis. So it's very important to understand that this diagram here above because it shows us where the sources are as well as the receptors and pathways to understand how the pharmaceuticals are distributed from source to sink. As you can also see in the table below there, that's previous research which was done and we can see that various pharmaceuticals were detected in their studies. These pharmaceuticals are present due to the molecular properties as well as their polarity. The pharmaceuticals of interest I chose were ones that are frequently used such as the pain medication, diclofenac, some that's, that's of course in contraceptives as well as in paracetamols and HIV medication. These are based on previous studies and also this pharmaceuticals are on the European watch list for emerging contaminants. My study site, so I chose six wasted treatment plants in Cape Town to have a representative um, picture of how the how pharmaceuticals are distributed in the environment. I also looked at various landfill sites and groundwater points at various resident, residential areas to see if pharmaceuticals had spread from the surface to the groundwater. You'll also see I have rivers that are adjacent to the wastewater treatment plant. That is where they discharge the water after treatment. This is my methodology. So I used grab sampling at my various sites. And I also took the various in situ parameters such as pH, EC, and temperature as this um, affects the distribution of pharmaceuticals and also the occurrence at specific places. Before we, we use the LCMS to analyze our samples, we first filtered them and use SP extraction, from, which is the one CC cartridge we used. And we set up calibration curves using the pharmaceuticals uh, standards. And then we filtered off the, the, the samples after that to get analytes of interest. With regards to our data interpretation, we use the removal efficiency calculation, as you can see there, Pre and post, pre meaning pre treatment, post after treatment. We then divide it by the pre treatment and then times by 100. I have to say, this is an estimate of the removal efficiency, not the exact one because we didn't use composite sampling, 24 hour composite sampling. I have got some preliminary results, as we can see. For the first waste treatment plant one, we can see that all the nine pharmaceuticals of interest was detected in all our sites. This is because these wastewater treatment plants weren't, ma weren't manufactured 
were manufactured to reduce pharmaceuticals. So therefore it is expected for them to occur. However, we can see that some occur quite high like acetaminophen, um, caffeine, naproxen, and diclofenac, as well as sulfamizoxal because of the polarity and um, low absorption, absorption cap capacity, low absorption capacity, therefore they're easily transported in the environment. We can also see with acetaminophen, um, by this one here, naproxen and progestin occurs in the groundwater points. This is because of the, the, the low absorption capacity, so they're able to pass through the surface through the groundwater and not absorb any of the sludge at the waste treatment plant, as well as the sediments as it passes through the surface. It can also be seen that caffeine and sulfamizoxal, we can see that at the Black River and at the outflow, we can see it's much more than the post-treatment. This could be that there are anthropogenic activities occurring along the river, such as informal sediments or industrial areas where, which, are, which could be contaminating either with um, disposing of the pharmaceutical straight into the river or, or raw sewage from these informal sediments nearby this waste treatment plant. With regards to figure three, we can also see that the removal efficiency is about 70 to 90 for majority of the pharmaceuticals. However, carbamazepine and diclofenac has uh, negative values due to it being a persistent um, pharmaceutical pollutant because of the polarity and well as low um, water co coefficient, water partition coefficient, meaning that they're easily transported in the environment due to the molecular structure and the um, polar bonds. Also, the, the negative value could be because they're accumulating inside the waste treatment plant and not because of the occurrence in, during the inflow. I also compare the treatment efficiencies of the MBR, the membrane bioreactor, as well as the conventional treatment, which consists of the primary and secondary treatment. We can see that the membrane bioreactor has a much better removal efficiency than the conventional treatment, as we can see with carbamazepine, diclofenac, and sulfamizoxal. That's because of the, the reduction process that occurs once these compounds move through the, pro through the process um, of the plant. Um, in conclusion, it can be concluded from the preliminary results that the pathways of contamination from landfill sites and waste discharge points to surface water and ground to do indeed exist for the nine pharmaceuticals considered. I do recommend that they improve water quality policies to include emerging contaminants, also to invest in advanced rem remediation treatment at waste treatment plants, as well as routine sampling in both surface and ground to mitigate the further contamination. Thank you. Hopefully I wasn't over the seven minutes. Thanks, Julian. Carl, that was so interesting. Thank you very much. It was really fascinating. Um, just two questions I'd like to put to you. The one is, where do you have your samples analyzed? Oh, at Tiger, uh, Stellenbosch University at Tigerberg. Oh, okay. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then the other question I've got is, do you collect your groundwater samples after treatment? Uh, no, no, it's the raw one and after. So with regards to Atlantis one, we look at the pre one when they abstract from the groundwater and one after treatment. But majority is before treatment. Okay, great. Um, Kyle, thank you very, very much. All the best with your studies. And thank I hope you. it goes really well. That was really fascinating. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good. I'd like to move on to the next speaker, um, to Akila Parker. She's doing her MSc um, with UWC. I think she can see the finish line. Uh, it's getting close now. Um, but Akila, we look forward very much to what you have to talk about the very complicated West Coast aquifers. Thank you. Um, I think Mikhail is still sharing his screen, so I'm unable to share mine. There we go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Akila Parker. I just want to get my screen going. Um, I am a master's student at the University of the Western Cape, and today I'll be speaking about my, oh, let me put it in presentation mode, sorry about that. Um, I'll be speaking on some investigations that I conducted in Saldana Bay. Um, the title of my thesis is investigating the natural groundwater recharge and discharge processes of the Saldana Bay um, aquifers. Just a bit of background into my study, Saldana Bay municipality are partially dependent on groundwater resources as part of the bulk water supply. The area has very limited resources which are fully allocated and on top of this the area receives very little rainfall, um, approximately 300 millimeters per annum on average. 
So several hydrogeological investigations have taken place in the area um, since the late 1970s. However, knowledge on the aquifer systems remain inadequate, particularly with regards to recharge and discharge processes. So my study aimed at investigating knowledge gaps and providing better insights and understanding on the Salvana Bay aquifer systems. Uh, this uh, map just shows the location and my sampling network I sampled in the areas between Aurora, Mariasburg, and Langban. <clears throat> A quick overview of the geology in the area. The yellow is quaternary sands. The pinkish color is granite outcrops in the area to the north. This is the Piketberg, um, Aurora Piketberg mountain range, this uh, table mountain group. And then to the right hand side, this is the Malmesbury group, which ended up being a very important um, section of my study area as it contains dolomites and dolomites are known to have more effective recharge rates and higher yields. <clears throat> Okay, so I conducted quite a few investigations um, for my master's research, however, I can't speak on all of them just because of time constraints, but I will speak about my water quality sampling, as well as the time domain electromagnetic airborne geophysical survey that took place in the area. So for my water quality samples, I collected groundwater samples on a quarterly basis in attempt to understand how water chemistry in the aquifer changes over time. I plotted my samples on a Piper diagram. Um, you can see that most of the groundwater samples plotted in this region of the Piper, indicating that most of the groundwater in Saldana Bay most likely had the same recharge source. And if you compare this Piper to the diagram on the right hand side, you can see that most of the samples can be classified as old water. So this is an indication of longer flow paths and also points to um, the recharge source for Saldana Bay being a regional source. I then had, look, had a look at stable isotopes, deuterium and oxygen 18. Um, I'm not gonna speak on too much on this. There's just too much to discuss, but I do want to draw your attention to the lower left quadrant of the graph. This is where most of my samples plotted. Um, the triangles at the top, these are rainfall samples, sorry. They are a bit more enriched than this rainfall sample. This um, sample was taken at the top of the Aurora Piketberg mountain range, and these are just local um, rainfall samples that were taken throughout the study area. What was interesting is that the boreholes indicated um, or encircled by the black were plotted very close to the local um, rainfall, and this gave an indication that there was probably a local recharge source. Um, those are bedrock boreholes, by the way. So it, it might be that, or I, I thought that it was local ground, sorry, not groundwater recharge. Groundwater recharge of a granite hill recharge where rainfall accumulates at the edges of hard rock granitic um, outcrops leading to oversaturation of the local zone, which results in recharge to the aquifer. The rest of the groundwater samples plotted fairly closely to this um, Aurora rainfall sample, um, which gave, which again pointed to the Aurora area being a regional source of recharge to Saldana Bay. I then had a look at tritium. As you can see, most of my samples had quite a um, low tritium value. So for tritium, older waters will have lower tritium concentrations, whereas more recently recharged waters will show tritium concentrations that are closer to the tritium input. So I measured the tritium input at around uh, 1.6 tritium units. How I did this was I set up um, isotope rainfall samplers across the study area um, and collected um, rainfall to sample or analyze for tritium. This borehole, um, I hope you can see my cursor, but this borehole is 37.2, it's at the top of the Aurora Mountains. Um, again, it plots close to the tritium input indicating a regional recharge source. The light blue dots are bedrock boreholes situated on the top of granite hill. So this uh, reiterates this local granite um, hill recharge component. And then the green borehole over here is a dolomitic borehole in the Mariasburg area. So this also points to the Mariasburg region being a source of recharge to Saldana Bay. Um, so I just want to quickly touch on the airborne geophysics that were done. This is a map. Um, of the area that was surveyed, as well as the SkyTem system that was used. Um, I just wanted to show you this. this is it says that I'm muted.
Akila, you're fine. Just continue. Oh, oh okay. Sorry, there was a, a notification. Thank you for that. Um, so this was very exciting for us because this was one of the preliminary um, geophysical results that also showed that this um, Mariasburg dolomitic area was bringing fresh water into this into the Saldana Bay. From the airborne geophysics, um, I generated cross sections. The map currently on the screen is just the bedrock elevation map generated from the geophysics. The blue is the deepest part of the aquifers, but I just quickly want to discuss some cross sections that I did that show recharge and discharge in the area. So this cross section is cross section three. It shows the Mariasburg recharge. The bedrock elevation suggests that water moves underneath the South River, passes the Hopefield well field and discharges into the Langaban Lagoon. Cross section A shows that mountain front recharge at Aurora. Um, it suggests that water moves in a southwesterly direction underneath the Berg River, passing Hopefield and then discharging into the Langaban Lagoon. And then cross section B shows that water moves um, from the Hopefield well field to Langaban Road upper and lower aquifers in northwesterly direction. This is just a quick overview of some of the cross sections I did. The only reason I'm showing this is to show you the earlier mentioned granite hill recharge. So in this graph, um, in this cross section, you can see that the granite hill recharge also brings groundwater um, into the system. It passes Langaban Road and discharges into the Berg River. And then just an overview, um, this, is map, this is a map I generated from all my um, results. The red, orange, maroon colors show discharge areas. So it's high salt content where there's um, no flow, no recharge occurring. And you can just see the general flow direction is via deep um, flow paths through these regional um, areas. And then the black arrows just show the general flow direction in the system. And you can see that the granite hills contribute um, to groundwater as well. So yeah, that was my study. In conclusion, I found that the Sultana Bay aquifers are mainly recharged via regional processes um, and that local um, rains or recharge occurs at the base of granite hills and feed the aquifer on a smaller scale. And then discharge zones I identified was Langevin Lagoon, the Berg River Springs and the surrounding oceans. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Keila, thank you very, very much. Your hard work is very evident and what you presented. So all the best with the write-up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we are a little ahead of schedule. Um, I think Kevin is okay with his question. It seems to be addressed. Jared, may I ask you to ask your question, if you don't mind? Okay, I'm going to, um, I don't know if you can, Akila address Jared's question. Um, he was um, saying, does tritium vary seasonally? And he says, we've seen variations as high as 1.2 TUs, summer um, versus winter. So my tritium, it, it didn't vary a lot from what I looked. There were some variations, but generally it didn't change much between seasons. Um, yeah, it, it didn't change much. So in, on average, when I when I looked at the tritium input, it was it was actually between um, 1.4 and 1.6, but yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And with regard to discharge, yeah. the primary discharge, do you agree that it's around the southern end of the lagoon towards Heelbeck, or, or are there other discharge points as well? So the May, I would say mainly it is um, at Heelbeck. Um, the other discharge points would be um, the Berg River. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think to a small extent, um, Saldana Bay, but I didn't, I didn't see much of that with my yeah. result. Okay, Akila, thank you very, very much, and, and all the best with getting this completed. Well done. <laughs> Thanks so much. Good. I'd like to move across to Ashley. Ashley's also busy uh, in the area looking at MAR. Um, Ashley, over to you, and all the best with completing your MAC as well. Ashley's with the UWC. Ashley, you're muted.
thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happening here. I'm so sorry I'm having technical difficulties. Um, So sorry about that. Um, my study focuses on identifying sites suitable for managed aquifer recharge um, in the West Coast aquifers near Saldana Bay. Um, just a little bit of background to my study. So the population in Saldana Bay um, is quite dependent on groundwater for a lot of its water supply needs. And then with pressures um, from domestic, uh, with, yeah, with pressures from population growth, industrial growth, as well as stuff like occurring droughts and climate change, um, there's an increasing urgency in the West Coast to protect this resource. So ultimately something needs to be done to bridge the gap between water availability and water demand in the municipality. And I'm proposing managed aquifer recharge to do so. Um, managed aquifer recharge system are planned systems whereby surface water or any type of potential water resources put into the ground, either through injection um, or infiltration through the aquifer to augment the natural resources. There are so many different types of MAR, but I'm just focusing on four. So for my ball injection techniques, I'm looking at aquifer storage and recovery. Important for these is that you are injecting like a lower, deeper aquifer um, that's below a confining clay layer. For my infiltration techniques, I'm looking at infiltration basins and infiltration galleries. Again, important for these techniques is you need a very permeable um, soil, soily aquifer so that the water can actually infiltrate um, into the saturated zone via the saturated zone. Um, to quickly show my study area, so I'm working in the Southern Abelical Municipality, focusing a lot at the Wildfield, so the Langevin Road Wildfield in green and the Hopefield Wildfield in yellow. Um, I did quite extensive research in the area, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'll just be talking about two of my field in investigations. Um, one of them being the airborne time domain electromagnetic geophysics. So geophysics data was used to delineate the various geological layers within the aquifer units that would support the injection and infiltration and storage of water for managed aquifer recharge. So I targeted the sands and the gravels that made up the deepest parts of the bedrock, as well as the areas of missing clay, we recharged to the deeper aquifer through the unsaturated zone as possible. I also did some aquifer testing in the area, focusing on unsaturated and saturated infiltration tests, as well as pumping tests to determine the hydraulic conductivities of the aquifer. I must note though, for pumping tests, um, I pumped three boreholes, but most of my pumping test data I used from previous um, pump tests that were done at the Langevin and Hopefield well field. Um, so yeah, so managed aquifer recharge will be targeted in higher yielding aquifer zones characterized by higher hydraulic conductivity. So this is what I'm looking for. Um, some of my geophysics results, um, I was able to um, use the geophysics to identify different bedrock elevations that make up the West Coast aquifer system. So the yellow color depicts areas of high elevation but most importantly the blue represents the deeper parts of the bedrock so the deeper the blue or the, the darker the blue the deeper the bedrock so the blue areas um, are the thick sands that were deposited over time and make up the aquifer and these areas are where i would like to target um manage aquifer recharge I also was able to um, identify the spatial extent of the clay layers within the study area. So using the map, I identified three regions in which clay layers were missing. So regions A, B, and C. Um, these regions, along with the potential sites for managed aquifer recharge, I generated these crossings. So I generated three cross sections except where my clay was missing as well as at the well fields and this was the conceptual um, diagram that I came up with 
So the, the most important thing that I want to note with this diagram is that at Langeband Road, the main aquifer system is situated below a thick clay layer. Therefore, borehole injections into high yielding aquifer zones would be the only possible MRA technique in this area. But the presence of the clay means that the main aquifer is a pressurized system. And as seen in previous studies at Langeband Road, MAR at the Langeband Road well field results in the formation of artesian wells. So I would only ever suggest managed aquifer recharge at the Langeband Road well field um, when the aquifer in this region has been depleted. So when water levels drop and there's actually space to do so. Um, at regions A, B, C, and at the well field, um, we start to see a layer of unsaturated sand. So that's that orange layer that you're seeing overlying the thick saturated sands of the aquifer. The presence of these unsaturated sands suggests that there is space to recharge the aquifer. Um, and the absence of the clay infers that MAR is possible through um, infiltration type techniques. So some results of my aquifer testing, I combined all of the data that I got from my pump test and infiltration test to display the spatial distribution of hydraulic conductivities across the study area. So just to explain um, the map, the unsaturated hydraulic conductivities um, characterize the very top soils um, in the area. The saturated hydraulic conductivities characterize the upper aquifer at Langevin Road or shallow aquifer at Hopefield. Um, and then the pump test hydraulic conductivities characterize the deeper aquifer systems. So looking at Langeband Road, we see low saturated hydraulic conductivities, which should suggest the sh shallow aquifer is a low yielding zone and not suitable for managed aquifer recharge. As we go deeper though, um, into the lower aquifer, we see evidence of higher yielding zones, and these are characterized by the higher hydraulic conductivity. So um, this tells me that MAR can be supported in the deeper Langeband Road aquifer. At Hope Field, we see almost a reverse. So the top soils have really nice high hydraulic conductivities, which definitely support MAR using infiltration techniques. Um, and then as we move deeper within the Hope Field aquifer, the hydraulic conductivity starts to decrease. So just to sum up um, my geophysics and my aquifer testing, um, I was able to identify a few sites that I think are suitable for MAR, starting with um, the Langeband Road well field, and I'm suggesting aquifer storage and recovery only if that when this aquifer is depleted. Um, at Region A, I'm suggesting aquifer storage transport and recovery. Um, I've also identified the Hopefield well field, and um, I think infiltration galleries are the best option for MAR here. At Region B, Oh, I also identified region B and at region B, I think either infiltration galleries or infiltration bases, just depending the amount of space um, you need for the um, MAR scheme. Um, and then likewise at region C, I think both infiltration galleries and infiltration basins would work as um, managed aquifer recharge techniques. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, Ashley, thank you. Also, your hard work and a lot of work um, is clearly evident. So thank you very much for that. Um, we don't have any questions, but one thing I was interested to know, if you say the aquifer should only be recharged once the water levels are drawn down, what is the source of your recharge water? What do you have in mind? So that's actually um, a part of my research that I didn't include. I just didn't have time. So I did a lot, um, some geochemical modeling in the area and I looked at three water um, sources. So I looked at the West Coast uh, pipeline, I looked at the excess water from the Berg River and I also looked at the treatment plant. And the results um, from my geochemical modeling definitely favored the pipeline in the Berg River as a source of water for MAR. Okay, Ashley, excellent. Thank you very much and all the best. I know thank you're you also so close, close to finishing off. Um, Yes, thank you so much, Julia. Okay, great. Um, Kevin, if you don't mind, I am going to move on. Um, yeah, let's move to another part of the country. Um, the name is beautiful, the Heuningness. Um, it's another part of the country that sounds very, very nice. And Abungile, we look forward to your presentation. Um, Abungile is also busy with his master's with the University of the Western Cape. Thanks, Abungile.
Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Uh, okay, let me just reshare the screen. So as I was saying, my name is Abu Faza uh, from the University of the Western Cape. My topic is uh, evaluating hydrochemical processes influencing groundwater quality uh, within the Henningness catchment of uh, South Africa. So as we know that uh, groundwater is a vital is vital to the development of most arid and semi-arid regions due to the limited pre uh, precipitation and surface water. Uh, the study of hydrochemical processes has been an area of interest in the past few decades. Chemical variations of groundwater can reveal the interaction between groundwater and the environment and provide a scientific basis for water resource management. Groundwater chemistry of a region is, gen is generally not homogeneous. It is controlled by geochemical processes, flow and recharge processes, and possible presence of contamination sources. Hydrogeochemical processes of groundwater help to obtain an insight into the contributions of rock soil water interactions and anthropogenic influences on groundwater. Thus, the identification of various geochemical processes helps to understand the cause of change in ground and water quality due to the interaction with the uh, aquifer material. Uh, as stated before, the the title of the work was evaluating hydrochemical processes of uh, ground, uh, influencing groundwater quality in the catchment. So the problem that we we're trying to address was that with the increasing effects of climate change on surface water resources and the increasing demand for water use, uh, using groundwater remains an alternative uh, source. However, in the current setting, the role of hydrochemical processes on groundwater chemistry and quality of different aquifer systems remains poorly understood. We thus argued that with the limited uh, application of an integrated geochemical approach to explore key hydrochemical processes leads to limited knowledge in the influence for the observed groundwater quality in the aquifer system. So we had uh, an objective which was to assess the water chemistry in relation to the current uh, groundwater qual uh, quality. So this is the study area, uh, the heading next catchment is shown in the map, it's in the Western Cape, in uh, Cape Agalas. So the second map shows that uh, the sampling points that were used for the study to collect the groundwater samples. So these are the methods and materials that were used. Um, groundwater samples were collected in pre-cleaned one liter uh, polyethylene bottles after pumping out water for about 10 minutes to remove stagnant water from the walls. The temperature, pH, electrical conductivity were measured in the field at the time of, uh, at the time of sampling using a, a Hach multimeter probe. Samples were then analyzed at the National Department of Agriculture lab in Elsenburg using inductive, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry. The obtained results were then tested for accuracy by calculating the charge balance error. Uh, the precision was set not to exceed 5%. As seen in the first set of results, uh, the dominant water type in the study area in both uh, the dry and the wet season was the sodium chloride type water. This is typical of coastal aquifers. Uh, this water signifies water that is ancient and of oceanic uh, origin. The paper diagram shows two samples, which are, as you can see here, it's piezometer 19 and pohole 10, that plotted separately from the rest of the cluster uh, of the samples for both seasons. Uh, piezometer 19 uh, plotted next to the mixed water region, which implies that sodium and chloride were not as dominant, instead ions were present in almost equal proportions. It is likely that piezometer 19 plot separately because the chemistry of the shallow groundwater at that site may be affected by the clay and peat material within the subsurface. Uh, however, for uh, bowl 10, uh, the dominance of calcium and magnesium was slightly more pronounced as compared to the rest of the samples. This is typical of groundwater in mountainous regions. To confirm these results, um, the Gibbs plot was employed. The distribution of sample, sample points in the Gibbs diagram, which is figure four, 
uh, shows that the ratio of cations and anions of the samples fall in the rock dominance in the rock dominance zone, suggesting that uh, precipitation-induced chemical weathering, along with dissolution of rock-forming minerals, was the dominant factor. This is suggested, suggesting that uh, chemical weathering of rock-forming minerals is the main causative factor in the evolution of chemical composition of the groundwater in the study area, followed by evaporative dominance in the wet season and precipitation dominance in the dry season. Uh, the second uh, set of results shows the bivariate plots, which were used to confirm the findings uh, from the Gibbs plot. So this, uh, this diagram here, which is the sodium chloride uh, ratio, the sodium chloride relationship has often been used to identify the mechanisms for acquiring salinity and saline intrusion in semi-arid regions. So it is said that if sodium comes from only halide dissolution, then the sodium chloride ratio is approximately to one. Figure five shows uh, the relationship between sodium, sodium and chloride ions in the study area. Uh, as you can see that most of the sampling points plotted above the, the line one is to one for the ratio, meaning that sodium, um, halide dissolution was not uh, a dominant uh, factor in the, in the contribution of sodium in the, in the study area. With us moved uh, to look at other pro uh, processes. Uh, one of the processes that we considered was uh, weathering processes. Uh, as you can see, R squared says that uh, weathering processes accounted for 65% of the variation in the water quality for the study area and was uh, deemed as one of the influential um, processes in the area. Uh, in terms of anthropogenic effects, there, were no, uh, there was no indication of anthropogenic effects. And this was not a surprise as there's no, not much uh, practices that are taking place in the, in the study area. So in conclusion, an integrated uh, geochemical uh, method was used to define groundwater chemistry patterns and provide reliable information. Geochemical assessment shows that dominance of sodium chloride water resulting from cation ex uh, ion exchange processes and silicate weathering. The first process of mineralization is reverse ion exchange uh, reactions, uh, which caused the depletion of uh, calcium uh, ions and magnesium ions and the enrichment of sodium ions. The second process is silicate weathering as uh, sodium uh, versus chloride plots indicated for all the samples with a ratio above one. The dissolution of uh, halide was ruled out as one of the dominant processes as most uh, samples were above the one is to one line. Thank you for your attention. Gile, thank you. Lovely presentation. Um, very, very interesting and well done. Thanks very much. Um, Jared, if you are available, uh, do you mind posing your question um, to Abangile? Yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, Abangile, great presentation. I really appreciated it. Um, just one question. Uh, you made a comment about the water being ancient and uh, of sea, like seawater origin, uh, just from your Piper diagram. Uh, is there any actual residence time indication or is it just uh, from literature that you know that these types of water are old? Uh, thank you for that. The, uh, the, the allusion was based on literature. Um, however, in the, in the study that I'm currently doing now, we will uh, try and look into uh, in, uh, in terms of residence time and age-wise of the water and instead of relying solely on literature. Awesome. Yeah, I think it would it would be a great uh, approach to constrain that residence time. You know, it has that seawater intrusion? If it is seawater intrusion, did it happen naturally a long time ago, or is this something that's happening now in the modern setting? I think I think it will be a good uh, dimension to your research. Yes, thank you very much. Great, Ivan Gili, thank you very very much, and thanks for your hard work and all the best with crossing the finish line. Thank good. you. I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Paula Benini, also a master's student with the University of the Western Cape. She's also working in the same catchment. And so Paula, over to you.
Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paula Finini. I'll be presenting to you under the first topic titled Assessing the Hydrology of Spring using the Hainness Catchment as the case study approach. Good groundwater and surface water. Groundwater and surface water interaction um, has been an important um, figure for the hydrological cycle. These two, um, these two hydrological um, resources have been seen as separate entities. However, given the time and the given the time and the recognition of the importance of interaction, these two have gained um, more recognition. The importance of understanding how this interaction occur influences the hydrologic budget, geochemical cycle, ecosystems, and global changes. Understanding the groundwater processes given the groundwater recharge, groundwater flow, and groundwater uh, recharge, it is important to understand how each and every one of those um, processes occur. However, this current study will focus mainly on groundwater discharge, which is often vitally important for maintaining available uh, ecosystems at the groundwater and surface water interface. Detecting and quantifying this counter um, discharge is challenging as the rate of flow can be quite small, exchange in uh, they are highly heterogeneous, both in time and space. Groundwater dependent ecosystem require um, groundwater in order for them to sustain their habitats, um, in order for them to sustain their habitats and their water budget, as well as the quality of the water that is discharged within these ecosystems. Therefore, the study will be uh, focusing on the springs, given that um, we know that there are various types of water dependent ecosystems, um, the wetlands, the seeps, um, but this study kind of study will focus on the springs because they are a true direct, uh, direct reflection of the state of groundwater in the aquifer that feeds them, and they are directly influence the springs and other surface water um, waters. This is the this is a research framework that's guiding the study. Um, as mentioned before, the high title of the study is Assessing Hydrology of Springs. The main aim of the study is to establish the self-service conditions that provide pathways for springs water and their chemistry suitability to support the ecosystem, especially in non-perennial river um, ecosystems. The study puts forward this problem statement that the role of groundwater discharge through springs and their characteristics remains poorly understood. Given that in order for us to understand the role of groundwater within an imperial river system, we need to evaluate and establish the role of the spring flows in the ecosystems. Putting thus forward the question, what are the subsurface characteristics that are responsible for the occurrence of the springs, their flow dynamics, and the quality in order for them to support non perennial river systems? With the study having three objectives, the first one, conceptualization of the study uh, of the springs, measuring the spring flows and assessing the water quality of the springs. So this is a, um, a, the research study setting, which is in the Hainness catchment within South Africa in the Western province. The study has five quaternary catchments with G5TB, C, D, E, and F, but the current study is focusing more on G5 of B and C. To collect the data, the data for the study, um, we used the GPS code, the GPS to uh, collect the spatial coordinates of the springs. Um, we used purposive sampling. The reason for purposive sampling when dealing with the springs, one needs to sample at the eye, not on the spring grounds. Um, and within the, the springs, we measured the in situ full parameters. To address the first objective, um, spring coordinates for all the springs were collected and they were mapped. As you can see, the red dots in here, they show all the spring coordinates. But this special distribution of the springs, um, they could be located and some could not be located as expected because the visit that happened, the full visit, it was during the dry season. Um, it was necessary to identify the spring types in order for us to understand how do they behave in space and time. The 
following cross-sectional area is only for this um, fault line here that has been generated. The TMG formation, which consists of weathered and fractures and stone together with quartzite rock, dominates the lower part of the catchment, which is seen um, in this diagram by this dark brown and the light brown um, colors. There is a change in lithological associated with most of these faults, and they provide the preferential uh, flow path closer to um, closer to the faults. So the spring occurrence here, seen by this blue thing, um, is due to the high density of the fracture within the table mountain, um, the table mountain uh, calcified dune sands. And um, they can, given that the visit was in the dry season, um, they show that um, there was more water that was, was observed here, showing that the, that could be due to the high density of the fractures uh, for providing the flow path for the spring. Um, the second objective, which was um, measuring the flows for, for the springs, um, we used an ecological indicator method to identify the flows of the springs um, so that we can actually locate the spring eye. We used the, these pine trees um, because we, when, we are at the, when we are at the site, not all the springs could be located, but with the use of ecological indicators such as the pine trees, we're able to identify some flows. Um, same applies to this diagram over here. As you can see here, the lines of um, the green trees, yeah, other than the, the stripe patches here. So we used those um, flows because they, they told us, uh, they gave us an indication that there was water in present day. This is just um, a video showing how the flows were within the study area. Um, this is high flows compared like, as expected, um, as not expected given that the study was for um, a dry season. Some flows were observed, some flows were not observed. Um, as you can see here on this first diagram, we, in, some, in some places, only moisture was evident in the ground, but in some, only slow flows were observant, but in some, it was just small trickles of water that seeps, but in some, the water was just stationary. Out of the 12 springs that were mapped um, previously, only six could be located. Um, to measure the flows, we used the float method. Um, with a full slot result, which measures how much time does it take for um, a, a given ob object to move from one A to point B, as you can see how the leaf moves there. Um, I need to mention that um, the flows, not all the flows could be um, measured given the time of the visit. However, the study is still ongoing to um, assess the flows for different seasons. When um, for assessing the spring quality, we used the, the radon analysis um, in water, which shows um, sorry about that. Um, we used the we analyzed for radon within our water, and it was the, given that radon is um, is an indication of roundup pathways, and in surface water the presence of radon is an indicative of recent seepage to of groundwater because radon typically decays rapidly from surface water waters um, as it is released into the atmosphere. Um, these are some. This is the radon analysis. Most of the samples that were uh, they were analyzed for radon, they had high radon. Um, the Saint Fontaine Spring having 119, um, Renosteth Group Spring 112, and the Elim they also had radon in it. Thus confirming that the sampling was indeed from ground discharge point, which is the um, sp spring eye, which may be um, from deep circulation. The source of this radon um, within the occurrence of these springs may be from the rocks. Uh, um, it, it, is a, it can be suggested that they, can, uh, they are from the rocks due to rock water interaction, as it is unlikely to find radon within um, surface water bodies. The study has been highly um, uh, affected by COVID-19 regulations and some science folders were disturbed. Thank you very much. All are great. 
Thank you very, very much for your presentation. Um, I'm not going to take any questions. Um, so, um, but thank you very much. That's just for time reasons. I would like to move across to uh, Stellenbosch University to Richidze. Um, she's going to present her master's work um, all related to grace. Thank you, Richidze. What? Hi everyone, my name is Richie Zenewuri. I'm a first year master's student at Stellenbosch University. Initially, I was supposed to do a poster presentation, but due to COVID restrictions, I'm not doing an oral presentation. My topic is evaluating, evaluating groundwater storage changes in the Western Cape using grid satellite data and groundwater measured data. Let me take you through GRACE overview first. GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. It was launched in 2002 and retired in 2017. It was then followed by GRACE follow-on mission that, uh, that started uh, in mid 2018 and is still at work. Both missions consist of two satellites that are orbiting around the Earth's surface at a distance of 220 kilometers between each other. When satellite pass over an area with, uh, with stronger gravity, it accelerates and after it passes that area, it decelerates. By measuring changes in the distance between the two satellites, Earth gravity fields can be mapped. Variations in gravity are interpreted as terrestrial water storage changes. Terrestrial water storage data is provided in centimeter of equivalent water thickness. The Western Cape province had a, a severe drought from 2015 to 2018. By that time, collective dam, dam levels, they hovered around 20%. 20, 20 in 2017, the Department of Water and Sanitation designated the 10th day zero. That's when the capacity of collective dam levels that make up the Western Cape water supply system would drop to 13.5% and water supply to most private taps would be switched off by that time. During the drought period, many boreholes were drilled. In this research, we're trying to find out how the groundwater system response was before the drought, during the drought, and after the drought. Our methods include collecting groundwater level data from the National Groundwater Archive and precipitation data from the South African Weather Service. We expect to see a prominent hydraulic head decline during the drought and a slow hydraulic head recovery after the drought, and also a prominent decline in equivalent water thickness during the drought. If what we expect is real, then we will advise policymakers to adapt grace follow on as groundwater monitoring tool and do a proper groundwater allocation. Figure two shows the creation of 68 wells that we have analyzed so far. We have we have observed three hydraulic, hydraulic head response from our 68 wells who have got dipping, delayed, and fluctuating. They, the wells that are producing dipping and delayed hydraulic head response, they are situated in the coast and at shallow depth as to compare to wells that are, that are producing fluctuating hydraulic head response that are situated inland. We are, we are using the hydraulic head response be, before the drought period as our baseline. Uh, for wells that are producing the dipping hydraulic head response, there was a prominent decline in hydraulic head in, during the drought with major peaks in May 2017 to June 2018. And the decline had continued even after the drought with peak decline in May, with peak decline in, in December 2019. If this continue, this could lead to saline. Uh, this could lead to saline intrusion, as these wells are situated in the coast and at shallow depth. For the wells that are producing fluctuating hydraulic head patterns, there are there was a prominent decline in hydraulic head during the drought, with major peak decline from May 2017 to June 2018, and has started to recover after the drought. For, for wells producing hydraulic head response, there was a prominent hydraulic head decline during the drought with peak decline from May 2017 to June 2018 and it started to recover. Data from, uh, from JPL of Grace and Grace follow on mission shows that equivalent water thickness declined intensively during the drought 
with major peaks from January 2019 to May 2017, though they are missing, the, though they are missing months, probably due to instrument issues and battery problems. Equivalent water thickness after the drought is very low as compared to pre-drought and during the drought. From our results, we, we concluded that hydraulic had declined intensively during the drought. Some wells are recovering while some are continuing to decline. Equivalent water thickness declined intensively during the drought and have not recovered to pre-drought levels. Our next step would be to explain why some wells are recovering where else some are not to identify hydrostatic graphic units that produce different hydraulic head patterns. To quantify depletion due to natural causes and pumping, to estimate water budget, to, compare, to compute groundwater storage changes from GRACE data, and to compare GRACE derived groundwater storage with in situ groundwater data. After all that, we'll then be able to recommend strategies on how to manage groundwater sustainably. I thank you. Great, thank you very much for your presentation, very interesting. Um, there's just one question I'd like to ask. Yes. Do you have any idea why the groundwater levels are not recovering in certain boreholes, even though we're having much better rainfall? I think uh, there is too much pumping at that site, even though not, we're not sure of the major contributor, it can be to, due to natural causes such as evapotranspiration or discharge to surface water since it's next to the ocean. No. Okay, great. Good. Thank you very, very much and all the best with your research. I hope it goes well. Thank you. Good. I'd like to move on to the next, uh, the last two presentations. These are um, the heavy hitters, but I would like to make a correction to the program. Uh, before introducing Yanni, it says on the program she's a PhD candidate. That's not true. She's a PhD graduate. So Yanni, well done. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, a massive congratulations to you. And we look forward to your presentation, Yanni. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Um, let me just get the screen to share. I presume you can see what I am sharing and not, it isn't correct, the correct mode and not presentation mode. Um, That's perfect. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Um, I just graduated, well, not graduated yet, but I just finished everything. Um, I've got the, the document from the university, so I am officially done, finally. But I'm just going to um, share a little bit of what I have did in my PhD. Um, that was titled Isotopic and Elemental Ratios to Assess the Relationship Between Yevelkis and Saline Groundwater in the Northern Cape of South Africa. There we go. Um, so the west coasts of Southern Africa experience arid to semi-arid climatic conditions and groundwater is the only source of potable water for most of the communities. However, the groundwater is saline and variably so. So one of the big questions were, um, was, what is the main cause of salinization in this area? Just a quick rundown on the study area. It was done in the Biffles um, River catchment in the Northern Cape of South Africa. The catchment is approximately 6,000 square kilometers in size, um, and it stretches from the town of Clancia along the West Coast um, across Namakulan towards Bushman land. The geology of the catchment is dominated by deformed granitic gneisses and remelted supracrustal um, rocks of the Bushmanland sub-province of the Namakwa sector of the Namakwa Natal Metamorphic province. In terms of the hydrogeology, multiple iso, um, isolated aquifer systems, alluvial aquifer systems, aquifer systems exist, um, as well as fractured, uh, fractured aquifer systems, which may be connected through fracture, um, fractures and faults. So saline groundwater in semi-arid to arid um, environments is expected to be related to evaporative concentrations of salts, um, followed by dissolution and percolation into the groundwater system. However, in Namakulan, the groundwater is variably saline and the larger regions stretching into Namibia um, do not experience the same level of um, level and variability of salinization, but yet they have a um, similar climate. 
if we look at the evaporation trends in terms of stable isotopes, um, the samples from the Buffalo's River catchment, um, this is groundwater samples, um, of course, are consistent with the global meteoric waterline. Sorry, where did I go now? There we go. Um, global meteoric waterline, um, if taken as a whole. Only the groundwater hosted in the Concordia granites, um, which are the pink triangles, may indicate an inherited evaporation trend and tracks that tracks back to the local meteoric um, water line. But the other samples collected from granitic host rocks do not share this trend. In addition to this, the alluvial aquifer systems um, in the Buffalo's River catchment represented by these little crosses um, are shallow and sh if in if any of these samples should show evaporative trends, it is expected that these would do, but no evaporative trend is seen. Instead, the samples plot along the global meteoric waterline. So what else could contribute to salinization of the groundwater in this catchment? Yevelkis. So Yevelkis are large biophysical mounds reaching up to 60 meters in diameter and is a common geomorphological feature in the west, um, southern western um, areas of Africa. Between 14 and 25% uh, of the landscape along the west coast of Southern Africa is covered in Yevil Keys. And this includes large parts of the Western Cape, which is a food producing hotspot. Yevil Keys are thought to be paleo termite mounds, specifically inhabited by the Southern harvested termites. Um, and they, the soils are generally nutri nutrient rich, heavily bioturbated and um, aerated with tunnels of up to a few centimeters in diameter as seen there. So geophysics was done across um, an area containing Yevelkis, and it was found that soil EC increased towards the center of the Yevelkis, as seen here, the red areas, as well as with depth. If you compare these two images, the top one um, is 0 .4, a depth of 0 0.5 meters, and this is for a meter. Um, while soils in the in the areas between Yevelkis, which is the inter Yevelki area, do not have the same EC values. So it is important to note that these salts are not produced in the Yevelkis, but that Yevelkis are um, zones of salt or salt storage zones, if I could put it that way. So where do the salts come from? Um, one source is marine aerosols, so anion and cation um, ratios in groundwater suggested that marine aerosols are transported inland. Um, these particles are then deposited on land and vegetation surfaces before being dissolved during a rain event, or alternatively directly washed from the atmosphere during a rain event and transported into the aquifer system. The second um, possible or source is water rock interaction and mineral weathering. Elevated strontium isotope ratios in groundwater correspond to um, the highly radiogenic signature of the host rock geology. Then sodium, calcium, and potassium um, uh, uh, concentrations in groundwater can be related to the weathering of granites. And then there's a, the, a distinct difference between the hydrochemistry of the groundwater hosted in alluvial sediments and that um, hosted in the granitic gneisses, which is directly related to water rock interaction and mineral weathering. But the question remains, is there a connection between salts in Yevelkis and the salinization of groundwater? So groundwater ages were calculated. Unfortunately, I can't go through all of the calculations and steps, but they were calculated and compared to the iron concentration in groundwater. So most, the most abundant anions in groundwater is uh, chloride, sulfate, and bicarbonate, represented here by the yellow, purple, and green lines. But keeping this in mind, um, gypsum, a calcium sulfate mineral, and calcite, a, ca a calcium carbonate mineral, are significant in the Yevilki soils. So during leaching episodes, halite, which would be um, responsible for the chloride, um, with the highest solubility constant, or K value, would leach first, followed by sulfate, which is likely from gypsum, and then only would bicarbonate go into, into solution when calcite dissolves. 
So looking at the anion uh, at the iron concentrations in groundwater versus the groundwater age, a few positive and negative incursions are seen, um, where all three anions um, are concentrations concentrations are increased and or and or decreased in the groundwater. So the two most significant incursions um, is the is or occurs in the neoglacial period and the Little Ice Age. Um, both of these periods were colder and wetter periods where enough, um, during which enough rainfall was received so that all the minerals could go into solution and leach into the groundwater system. So with the, inf that inf the groundwater information in mind, um, Yevilki carbonate ages were calculated um, and the position of these ages in a profile were investigated. So the depth to a carbonate horizon in calcareous soils is proportional to the mean annual precip uh, precipitation and can indicate periods where enough water has moved through the soil to form leaching fronts. Calcite bearing horizons of similar age in the Yevilkis show U-shaped wetting fronts. Um, these U-shaped fronts show that water is preferentially tr uh, transported through the middle of the Yevilki as carbonate situated deeper in the Yevilki in the center correspond or carbonate ages correspond to that um, of shallower ages on the side. But the question remains, are these Yevilki, uh, are these salts uh, flushed down deep enough to enter the groundwater system? So this is a mouthful, but stable um, isotopes of sulfur in sulfate provide information regarding the origin of sulfates and hence other salts. Um, so here the chloride to sulfate ratio is compared to the stable sulfur isotope ratio in sulfate in both groundwater and Yevilki soils. The sulfur isotope ratio of Yevilki sediments plot in the upper non-sea um, salt field, non-sea salt field represented in gray, um, the granite field represented in red. Um, but just below the seawater or the line representing seawater, um, indicating that the origin of sulfates in Yevilki sediments are a combination of marine salts and non-sea salts. These non-sea salts are basically um, carried in aerosols, but do not originate from the ocean. Um, so the delta 34A, so the sulfur isotopes um, of the groundwater is more variable, but can be related to the geology um, and the spatial distribution of Yevilkis. Groundwater samples collected from the sediments where, Yevilki, where the Yevilki density is high have similar um, sulfate isotope signatures than that of Yevilki soils, so that um, relationship, but um, is depleted in sulfate relative to seawater, while the Yevilkis are enriched in sulfate relative to seawater. This can be explained by the fact that the Yevilkis consist of the nutrient-rich soils containing sulfates and are zones of salts um, or where salts are accumulated. And then during a um, precipitation event, water passes through the Yevilkis um, and NaCl, so uh, halite or sodium chloride, would be dissolved first. Um, and leached into the groundwater system, leaving the groundwater, which is represented here, enriched in sulfate relative to chloride compared to the Yevilkis, which be, would be enri enriched in, uh, I'm lying, sorry, this is um, groundwater being enriched in chloride relative to sulfate, while the Yevilkis remain um, enriched in sulfate as the the chloride minerals would dissolve and leach first. Ooh, sorry. So in contrast to this, um, samples collected from the granitic nice host rock where Yevilki density is low are enriched in sulfates relative to seawater and Yevilkis. Here, the salts are likely to be, to be derived um, from mineral weathering in the aquifer um, together with a combination of um, marine aerosols and non-sea um, salts. 
So some of the conclusions, the origins, um, the origin of salt in groundwater is a combination of marine aerosols, water rock interaction and mineral weathering. Yevilkis act as storage zones of salts, um, which mainly originates from dry deposition of marine aerosols. Yevilkis act as preferential flow paths during um, groundwater recharge. And in areas of increased Yevilki density, Yevilkis contribute to groundwater solution, uh, salinization. Thank you. Yoni, thank you so much. It was really interesting. And uh, I think in the interest of time, we're going a little over the program. We've got one more presentation. And uh, Yoni, if you don't mind, I'm gonna move on to, to Angelo. That's great. Fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, maybe it's one of Reynolds' first Afrikaans words, uh, Yevokis. So. Okay, let's move over across to somebody who's extremely busy. Um, Angelo, also working on his PhD, plus many other things. Angelo, over to you. Uh, thanks, Julian. Um, just move it aside. And welcome to the graveyard shift, everyone. Um, I'm Angelo Johnson, PhD candidate at the University of Western Cape, um, also junior scientist at Sandbox. And I, yeah, so I'm basically conducting hydrogeological and geochemical investigations to improve sustainable mine closures in South Africa, with specific focus on mining activities, neighboring um, our national parks, protected areas. Um, So it's just, just a bit of background. Uh, sustainable mine closing in South Africa. Oh, well, mining has commenced in the late in the 1800s in South Africa and is uh, a cornerstone of our in our economy. Um, also, mining mine closure specifically is um, well regulated in South Africa with the NEMA and the EIA regulations. And most of our mining jurisdictions legislation is um, based on international best practice and therefore fairly universal. However, it is known that big mines in South Africa uh, do not obtain closure certificates and uh, that raises a question as to why not. Um, so as part of my PhD investigation, I am, the aim of my, my, my research is to improve the prediction of potential mine, potential impacts post mine closure through conducting appropriate hydrogeochemical investigations that will benefit sustainable mine closure, based, mostly focusing on um, is enough research being done um, before the mining activity, but actually uh, commences. And that is what I am busy with as in one of my case studies is a geochemical investigation on a phosphate mining acti activity uh, neighboring one of our national parks. And for, the, the, for this presentation, I will focus on, from that mining activity, I will focus on um, what I've done so far in terms of optimization of mineral separation techniques, um, brine handling options, and also, um, um, mine management options through these invest, uh, geochemical investigations. So from a mine, mineral separation technique, um, they are, uh, they're basically experimenting between a reverse reverse flotation method and then also a direct reverse flotation method. So I'm not going to detail um, how these methods work, but, but uh, the reverse reverse flotation method is uh, consists of an amine collector, um, no, um, Chemicals are, are are used for uh, the separation of the of the of the phosphate minerals, and then you have the direct reverse rotation, which con which consists of a process where sulfuric acid, fatty acids, and sodium silicate is added. And um, bin scale test, um, mining testing, mining tests were conducted on these two um, mineral separating methods, and the tailings from these. Um, methods uh, were, were leads in the laboratory um, to, to determine the, the leaching behavior of the tailings and how, um, how optimized 
which which one of the two methods is 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 better uh, compared than the other one and some of the 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 leaching results showed us that the direct reverse flotation method um the leaching behavior from that showed us that um most of the the phosphate product is being extracted through the direct reverse filtration method so in terms of mineral separate separating and um extracting the product the direct reverse filtration method is more favorable um compared to the reverse reverse filtration method so that is that that is most probably the the method that um they will go for however and also um as you can see the the twin the direct reverse flotation method um the green is is how um more efficient the method is compared to the other one is only one negative where the the fluoride leachate was a little bit more than the the in the direct reverse compared to the reverse reverse um however that was only on the first first leach and the fluoride doesn't leach more or less after that it, it stays constant um however the direct reverse um method results in a in brine production so um you get better mineral extraction and less leachate from the tailings but you producing a brine water now so what do we do with the brine uh the brine water so it was modeled that this there can be three options that they can do with the brine water so it was basically the brine water will go through a reverse osmosis process which will result in either a low brine recovery high brine recovery and an optimized um, water recovery um, that the, that it goes through and this is this is data that i used for an input a geochemical model and i i modeled that against the tailings the overburden how it will if it reacts with that um what will um, be the result of that and then also the input water and ground water i used as input input um data for my geochemical model so just an overview of how i set up the model on the left hand side you'll see the first two years that it's what we predict from the mining activity so you have the uh this will be a one to three um ratio where the tailings will be mixed with with the ro reject water so, so remember the re the ro reject water is is three options so it was modeled the all three options were modeled and then that will be deposited on the on the overburden on top of the 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 surface and then i modeled basically i modeled what would precipitate and what will dissolve in that which dissolves i react with the overburden on which is so that would is only way to the groundwater so that so some some stuff will precipitate and others will dissolve and and follow through to to the groundwater where it will place where it will mix with the groundwater and all of these processes i i modeled so it was in terms of the the years so these are two years um and then from a three to nine years period we um they will start backfilling again so that that process was also modeled so in the, the next slide this slide is but is where um i basically depict um how it will happen so during the first three years what i did um in my geochemical model is i modeled the auto tail the auto reject with the tailings which reacts with the overburden and after that I, I i take that output and that reacts with the, the overburden on the way to the groundwater so there will be a, a geochemical reaction happening there and after that um in the three three to nine years period that groundwater will report to the to the pit and that was modeled so that's scenario number four and then post closer nine years post closer all the water will will report to the pit so there will be reactions happen in the pit and that was modeled and just to show you um this is i'm just showing you the optimized water rejection um simulations that was modeled so on the left hand side the first column you'll see the threshold one stage one thresholds that the mine are not allowed to 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 go over then there's the sand standards and then the pbh4 is the background water quality and as you can see they are for the ec chloride if uh, iron and then also the sodium is already above the stage one threshold um 
So in terms of all the mixed reactions, um, the RO mixing with rainwater onto the tailings and the overburden that was modeled and you can see it here. Um, so we you, we don't see colors here. We we can see. I, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but in this area you can see there's there's no um, impacts um, predicted here. But post closure, nine years post closure, there's a scenario with no solids into the pit, and then the scenario with solids into the pit. So that means as you backfilling just overburden. That's with no solids and the tailings. And then the other two is, those two is, but is um, backfilling, wet tailings, and auto water, and the overburden. And there are some concerns that arise from that. So there's, there's an increase in fluoride. You also see an increase in sodium, and then also um, sulfur, you see an increase. However, there are different mine management options you can with that that I look at that so we can prevent um, impacts from a geochemical perspective. So if you if you so the different scenarios is you put the overburden with the tailings and the RO back into the pit. That is not um, favorable as you've seen the, um, um, some of the, the, the leachates they they increase and go over the the, the, the wallet, water quality standards. And then there's a scenario where you put the overburden at the bottom, and then you put the tailings on top with the RO saturated sands. That's an that's an that's an an option that that can go for. But most probably the favorable one is putting only the overburden first into the back into the pit and putting the tailings without RO water and um, making another plan with the RO water, not putting it back into the bed pool. So as you can see. That red line is is um, depicting tailings with RO, so that's uh, that's a no go for for uh, mine management option. However, if you put it above the the the, the water the water level in the area, uh, you can expect some precipitation of the salts in there. So um, the leachate from from above in the unsaturated zone will be less towards the the ground. So that might be a, a favorable position to put the tailings and the RO into the unsaturated sands with the overburden below it. So in summary, the geochemical model predicted um, uh, basically fav favor the, the optimized recovery without the solids in the backfill. And then the, um, it also predicted that the overburden and the tailings should be separated um, while they are busy mining. So while they, they excavating the pit, they must put the overburden on one side and the, the tailings on the other side so that they can have an option as to how they they going to backfill um, depending on the predictions. And then backfill with the overburden first is most favorable so that it's only the silica sands that will become saturated post closure um, to um, limit some of the mine water impacts coming from the mine. And then further research are, are, are being conducted to test the, the precipitation of RO salts from the uh, reverse osmosis um, treatment and in hopes of increasing um, the hydraulic connectivity. If the results are favorable, the backfill above the overburden and unsaturated zone is a go-to. If not, we're still working on additional ways to deal with um, the RO salts uh, that will result from the brine handling options. And that is it. Thank you. Um, questions. Angelo, thank you very, very much. Uh, that's really interesting and really good work. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, we've gone a little over time, but those presentations were absolutely fascinating, uh, really interesting. And I'd like to wish all of the students the very, very best with their journey to completion. And once again, Yanni, congratulations on graduating. That's really well done. So all the best to, to all the other researchers. Uh, I trust it goes well. And from my side, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending. And then I'd like to hand over to Samaya. She's the chairperson of the GWD Western Cape uh, to close off the seminar. Thanks, everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, I actually just want to say thanks to all our presenters. Um, 
they've done a sterling job and I've seen some of very nice comments uh, to everybody. Uh, exceptional presentations. Um, let's see what else. Yeah, very high quality presentations, primary data driven. I'm just going through some of the comments here. Um, but this has definitely been a wonderful opportunity for our students to share their ongoing research within the Western Cape. Um, I really hope that this can start some conversations between the institutions and researchers with our students. Um, yeah, thank you all for taking the time to participate today and I hope to see you all at the next planned session and uh, hopefully at the ground to division conference coming up yeah thanks everyone